we're in first john we did first john chapter three remember and then first john four comes after three but we studied for first john four not too long ago so with your permission we're gonna take a quick vote no we're not but we're going i'm gonna skip it first john chapter four remember we studied it when we talked about trying to decide or discern what true love is of course we, you know we said christ god sent in his son that is true love and christians actually obeying the commandments that is true love we studied that out i want to get to first john chapter five i think it'll be a good application for our hearts but in particular, before we plow through this one chapter, I want to go to another chapter. And I want to piggyback off of a verse in chapter 5. Look at 519. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. That statement, the world hates that statement. What do you mean you are of God? You think you're some chosen, you have the corner on the truth? Well, I'm sorry, Christians are the chosen of God. We are of God. Christians are because of the blood of Christ. We are. And when you become filled with the Holy Spirit, more and more you realize that, yeah, this whole world is filled with wickedness. Right? To look at wickedness in this world, I want to look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We haven't looked at it in a while, especially through the lens of, I don't know, current events and what could, right, could be right around the corner. You know, I'm, you know who I vote for, and it's not because I, I think um, the man is saved or spiritual or prayerful or any of those things. I don't. But the big reason I cast votes in certain directions is because if you, if you don't, our world will look just like Romans 1. It's already a world filled with wickedness, but just wait till the most wicked people rule. The most wicked, okay? The ones who just want to push the agendas you see in Romans chapter 1. That's what we're looking at tonight. Uh, a wicked world, and then we'll go back to 1 John 5, and we'll look at how can a Christian live in a wicked world. But let's first let's define what we're talking about. 1 John chapter, or excuse me, Romans chapter 1 and 15. Paul says, So as much as in me is... I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I want to start talking first about what does it mean to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ? What does it mean? Does it mean that you're ashamed about the story of Calvary? I truly don't like talking about it, right? I'm just ashamed of it. Rarely does it ever mean that. Being a sh you know, it would be ashamed to say, you know, I'm a Christian. Rarely does it ever mean that. What, what, we're, what Christians are ashamed about is talking about the full gospel of Jesus Christ. We're ashamed about the details. We're ashamed about the implications they have for people's lives. That's when we're ashamed, right? There's really no shame. I mean, think about that. People... Everyone celebrates Christmas, right? Practically everyone. No one's ashamed of saying, I celebrate Christmas. No one's even ashamed of taking a survey saying that I'm a Christian. That's not where the shame's at. So we have to think about this deeper. When Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, what does he mean? Talk about shame. Well, how about some of the things I just said? Even that sentence that I just read in 1 John, when it says, we are the people of God, we're God's people, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Are we ashamed to say that? This exclusive sentence that, no, we are God's people. We are God's chosen people. It's an exclusive sentence that we can be ashamed about, right? Because it sounds prideful. It sounds like the world will come back and say, what, you have a corner on the truth? We do. We do. Christians do. We are God's chosen people. The rest of the world is wicked, and Christians are saved by grace through faith. Praise the Lord. We're going to heaven. The rest of the world's going to hell, okay? You don't brag about it, but you don't be ashamed about it either. You'll be ashamed because that's the truth of it all. How about being ashamed about that in general, about heaven or hell? We can talk a lot about scriptures, but when we, when we start to touch on the subject of someone's going to burn forever and ever, they have rest, nor day, nor night, all of a sudden we get a little bit more ashamed of what we believe. You know, this is this could be kind of a fairy tale. Might not be a fairy tale. Could be true. Might not be true. I don't know. So I'll just talk about the easier stuff. Well, that's being ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the full gospel. I think very much what Paul says that he's not ashamed of is the fact that the gospel is there for sinners. Paul makes it very clear. He writes his letters to sinners, right? 
He tries to explain to people that there's sin inside a church in Corinth, right here, or outside of a church in other books. Are we ashamed to talk about sin anymore? And this is really where I think this verse could be applied to all of Christendom. The realm of profession, are you ashamed to still talk about the sins for which Jesus died? Ashamed, ashamed, ashamed. Look, it says, For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. That verse is found in a lot of places, so it can mean a lot of different things for your life. The just shall live by faith, right? In this context, though, it sounds to me like we are to preach. It takes some faith to be able to preach, all of us, right? To be able to stand up for these things that could make us ashamed or people could um, yell at us about, it takes some faith to stand up and proclaim them anyways. His context here is preaching the gospel. Remember verse 15 and verse 16. He says, as, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Look at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You know, the funny thing about this whole equation is that it says that we are God's people and the whole world lies in wickedness, and we're supposed to stand up and say that. You know, you're God's people if you accept Christ your Savior. Everything else is wickedness. We're supposed to say that. The funny thing is that the world already knows this. The world already knows that the world is wicked, that wrath is coming. And look, in particular, it says in verse 20, um, by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, um, let me read that again, reading the word, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Who is the his? The his here is talking about Christ. It's all the same sentence. The context is, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. When it says even his eternal power and Godhead, it's talking about Christ and everything about Christ, the deity of Christ, the power of Christ. That Godhead means he's part of the Holy Trinity, right? He is deity himself, God manifests in the flesh. The world, in fact, knows this. The world knows, in fact, that Christians are right. That God is real, that Christians are right, that Christ is the Savior, and that their sin is going to damn them to hell. God says, because of all this, they're without excuse. That's our state. You know what we really are walking through in this world is a bunch of deniers. A bunch of deniers of things they already know. It'll some, it sometimes makes you impact how you approach people. Oh, you're just this innocent, innocent person. Well, a lot of people are just flat-out deniers, not innocent at all, right? Not innocent churches that preach falsehoods. Not innocent atheists who are without excuse. 21. We all have COVID now. 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Yeah. The world knows Christ. Um, but here it says, they don't glorify Him as God, neither were thankful. Like I said, all Christians, or all people know about Christmas, right? We all know about this Christ. But do we glorify Him as God? Do we thank Him as God throughout the year? No, we don't. We're just like this. We know God. Know God, a new God. 22 is where our world's at today. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Whoever, who's, who's met a very cocky, arrogant um, college professor who hates God? Uh, I, I probably have. You probably have. Who has also met a very cocky, arrogant um, person who's never been to college that hates God? I've met someone like that. We all have. I always preach this, profess themselves to be wise, they became fools. It is true that academia really holds a corner on this thing, but it's everybody. People are so sure of themselves today. Everyone thinks, everyone thinks they're smart, don't we? Everyone thinks they're smart because we've all been told we're smart. 
We think we're, we just know a lot of things because we live in this technologically advanced era with all this information. We know a lot of things. We Googled something last night, stayed a holiday in the week before. We've got all this kind of information. I don't know what, I don't know what lends itself to this other than pride. Pride. And when you get so prideful, you start concocting new ideas that are beyond, far beyond the scope of Jesus Christ came and died for you to save your soul. Sin is bad. Hell is real. And when we get so wise in our world, like we are in the year 2020, that I'm, I'm sorry, that, that's what we saw on TV last night. Profess themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, into birds, into four-footed beasts, and creeping things. We'll talk about this in a second, but if you watch, and I've talked about the debate, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but... There was a point in the debate where they were really, the moderator was really trying to hone in on global warming, right? Global warming. And it's a, if that's his deal, that's his deal, right? So real, let's talk about that. But it just makes me appalled that in our national debate for the President of the United States, in our national discourse, we're talking about our creation, right? We're talking about the creature. We'll see it again here in another verse. So worried about global warming right so worried about keeping this world afloat this is just the creature it's just the creation no mention of god i don't know if there's any kind of even close mention of god in about an hour and a half of talking right among the people that are supposed to lead our whole nation and i already before we started i've said i'm voting for who i'm going to vote for because biden will absolutely ruin the country but i am scared because I don't see God-fearing men or women anywhere. I don't see on the news after or before. I don't see anywhere in the media. I don't see it in my personal life. In this little valley, I really don't see God-fearing people. I see some people who I can stand with, with about conservative values, right? And I stand with them in the voting booth. And, but I'm sorry, you know, these people that are conservative for things like guns and masks and the economy, I'm telling you, they are going to stab Christians in the back when we move forward. On the topic of Romans chapter 1, we will have no friends. I'll, sh I'll tell you what I mean. And it makes me, I'm not worried, I'm not scared, but Christians need to know how to pray because... Whether this Trump remains president for another four years or not, soon is coming a day where Romans chapter 1 is the law of the land. You can't speak against it. You can't teach against it. You can't live your life without getting involved and accepting it. We'll talk about what we mean here. If you've never read Romans chapter 1, you're in for a treat. I think you have. Okay. 24. Oh, by the way, one note inside that debate as well. What was that one note talking about? And this one Trump was really good on. He said, um, sensitivity training, right? Since we don't need this kind of sensitivity training is really professing yourself to be so wise as if this is helping people. You want to help people love their neighbors themselves? Get them in church. It's what worked for, for, for thousands of years. That's what worked. Sensitivity training is why you have a bunch of riots now. Is why people now, we've, we've actually pointed out differences and we made such a big fuss about differences in, in melatonin levels. Before that point, just a, a dumb old Christian says, you just love your neighbors yourself, right? Treat people the way you want to be treated. The old golden rule of the Bible. Now we have sensitivity training. The Romans chapter 1 will not pass sensitivity training. I'm sorry. So if you want to, you know, walk out right now, go ahead. I've lost half the crowd. Be just by myself by <laughs> that point. Okay, 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, <laughs> to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Whose fault is it? It's the lust of their own hearts they're going this direction. God, when you see that language, that simply means God more or less gave up. God says, is that what you're lusting after? Then you have at it, right? He pleads with people and he pleads with people. And you should look at this in like in a whole, whole holistic type of sense. A people, a nation. He pleads with nations to get right, but if they just keep lusting after ungodly sins, then eventually God says, okay, maybe I'm done sending evangelists their way. Maybe I'm done sending preachers. Maybe that, maybe that city over there in California by the bay, maybe I'm just going to give, give up on a little bit. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's okay. 
through lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own to dishonor their bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. I am not surprised, but I don't know if the word is appalled at the realization, the cold realization, that you could never go to one of those presidential debates and say anything about the Bible. None of them do. You mention God loosely, right? You don't, you profess you know God, profess you've got some faith, but you can't quote a scripture. You can't pray. I mean, I'm, I long for a day when our nation actually had saved men going to those things, right? And they give some sort of prayer-filled response for some problem in the nation. Wouldn't you love that? Actually, you have a prayerful man, and then it says, he says, you know, well, this, there's a text over here that can help us lead our country, a prayer. You know, let's pray for wisdom here. It's all a show. The only time they mention prayer is to try to get the vote of some certain sect of Christianity. It's all a show. Their own bodies between themselves who change the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. This worshiping the creature is a lot of things. I've always preached about it being evolution and how we've given into that lie as opposed to sure truth from Genesis. We, we traded that. And of course, it has to do with global warming and this love of this earth that we think we're going to keep it going forever when one day we know that God's going to destroy the whole thing with fervent heat. On both fronts, instead of those things, instead of evolution, we should be looking at the Bible. Instead of looking at the state of our ice caps, right? We should be looking at the state of men's hearts, growing cold, um, dark. <clears throat> Instead of worrying about and worshiping people, we worship people now. Serve the creature more than the creator. We talk about forever about sensitivity training, right? We've got to make sure people feel good, right? How are you treating other people? Well, what about Almighty God? We know, I already said the recipe. If you, were, if you had your eyes on God and you serve God right, then you'd serve everybody else just fine. But instead, we're trying to serve every little person and all their idiosyncrasies and all of their sin and accept them and embrace them and promote them. You can't do that and live. It'll make a, a chaos of a world because we put man above God as the one we're trying to please. Day in and day out. Man is unpleasable. Man is fickle. And we're not called to do that. Yeah, yeah. Look at verse um, 26. Here's what man is. For this cause God gave them up into vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use unto that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Before I jump to that, let me give one more example of 25 worshiping the creature more than the creator that I had in my mind before. It is the women's right to destroy a baby, right? A woman's law, women's law is above God's law, destroy life. It's another example of worshiping the creature more than the creator, right? All these things, these come up. That came up, right, inside the national debate What's the Supreme Court justice going to allow? Are they going to allow us to keep killing babies? Because that's the right answer. And even the one that I'm for can't necessarily say anything matter of fact there. Afraid to lose votes. Got to win an election. I understand, got to win an election. It's just sad that to win an election, you've got to throw the Bible out the door. This is what will end Christians, though. I have a lot of people talk to me, and they, they you know, we had to make decisions about masks. We had to make decisions about keeping church open, and I make it stand on keeping church open. On masks, out in the world, in the places of business, I just obey people. But I always come back and say, this is not the biggest thing, right? This mask is not the big thing. If you think, if you think it's big, wait till Biden's in there, and they start pushing the LGBTQ agenda down our throats. I'm telling you, pr Christians, we need to start praying. Don't hide, run for the hills, but pray that God keeps the door of utterance open somehow. It's going to be like praying, if you're a Jew, you know, in the Nazi era, praying that somehow you can still stay afloat 
and live and function. Well, we want to live and function as Christians still. Because I tell you, it's coming. They're going to start throwing Christians out of jobs, federal jobs, state jobs. You can't hold this if you have that kind of belief. Fining Christians for saying things, doing things. Shutting down Christian schools, for sure. And absolutely, the LGBTQ agenda will get inside churches. It'll probably start with the 501c3 status and all these goofish churches are going to say that that's, that's a mess if you're going to say I can't preach Romans 1, 1 anymore. But it'll come down even more. Property taxes, churches will start playing taxes if they don't um, avoid Romans 1 and all the other passages, right? It's going to impact us by and by. And before long, it will absolutely just be declared hate speech. If, this, if these things, if already you can't say these things without getting censored on Facebook, right? Shut down on Facebook. We're only a step away if you can't say them anywhere. In the public realm, in your house, in your pulpit. It's going to come. This is what will put people in jail. And this is what being ashamed of the gospel of Christ is really going to hit the road, hit the, where the rubber hits the road for us. Right? We need to be prayed up. Ready to stand. The abortion issue was the sacred cow that pushed a lot of evil. A lot of it through Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? Here, we'll use this thing. We'll put it up on a pedestal so that women have no clue it's important anymore. All of a sudden, a career is more important than a life, which has never been the case in the history of our world. And now, all of a sudden, we'll put up this people, these people choosing to live in what the Bible calls is a vile behavior. It calls it an unseemly behavior. Tell you, the Romans 1 needs sensitivity training, right? It's a vile behavior, an unseemly behavior, but now the world is going to lift that up. And if you don't bow down to that God of unseemly behavior, then you are going to be penalized, persecuted, imprisoned, it will come to. One day it'll probably come to death. That issue, it's the issue that undermines societies in history. It's the most blatant. What does God say? God says it's, it's the most blatant contradiction to how he created something. Men with men working that which is unseemly, receiving themselves that recompense of the air which was meat. God does not like when people take what he created and, and then flip it completely backwards, right? God does not like when he set up homes to be run a certain way and then people completely change the use of the home, right? And when he creates our bodies to be used in a certain way, he doesn't like us to flip it on its end. Unseen, receiving themselves that recompense their air, which was meat. Where is the CDC when we need them? Talk about all the health risks of this ungodly lifestyle, of transgenderism. It's not healthy. All these ways that they're trying to change hormones in people's bodies, they don't know what they're doing. We have modern day Frankensteins, but we're so wise today that we lift us up as highly educated man that now we can pump something into somebody and they can start looking a little bit more like the opposite gender. Okay, whoop de doo We've really cracked the code, haven't we? There's still a man, there's still a woman. God only made, God only made those. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. These people who do these things, they are, they have God in their mind, but they don't want God in their mind. It says they didn't retain God in their mind. They do everything they can to get rid of the thought of this creator, of this judge. And I'll tell you what a Christian's job is. Don't let them get God out of their minds. Bring it back up. Why has our world fallen apart? Because Christians have let people get God out of their minds. Christians don't speak. We got lulled into the whole lie of love. We'll reach them through love. We'll reach them through acceptance. No, through love and acceptance, we will push them merrily on their way in the path of destruction, and along with it, our nation. It's really true. Sad thing is, we need to be strong and we need to raise strong kids, right? Right, parents? Because if the Lord tarries, they're going to be fighting over more than masks. It's going to be a bigger battle. It's going to be, are they going to be ashamed of the gospel? Or are they going to preach and go to jail? Right now, it literally is. I mean, and some Christians are freaking out and they need to be more prayerful and they need to understand the big picture. But we could have freaked out over seatbelts, okay? Right? Are you ashamed to wear a seatbelt or not? 
And all of us, we are not ashamed of the seatbelt. <laughs> I'm getting confused with my analogy here. But the battle is not seatbelts. The battle is not speed signs. The battle is not mask right now. The battle is coming, and it's going to be filled with this nonsense. 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers. This is what a, a nation looks like when they don't retain God and God says, okay, you've got your wish. I'm done. Go on your way. Go to the conclusion of those sins and you'll see that it's air. It brings recompense upon the individual. It brings recompense on a nation. Righteousness exalts the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Sin is a reproach. Sin is the opposite of righteousness exalting you. Sin is the reproach that's going to bring you down to nothing. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. We've forgotten God. Any, any evidence of that? We'll try an hour and 30 minute debate with the two most important men in the nation vying for the most important seat in the world and God in the Bible was nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. And then dig down deeper and you'll see that really 100% of the nation is, well, I guess there's the independents, but they're not independent for a good reason, but you find the rest of the nation just thinks that these guys are rock stars, right? And don't get me wrong, I'm, st I'm still voting Trump. God can't have Biden. But these guys are not, well, you're, you should not put faith in men. Faith in men. I wish we had a day when we still had prayerful leaders in office, don't you? Maybe at least in this town, we can have prayerful leaders in office. Maybe in the state, you can have a prayerful leader, a saved person in office. But there will be a deluge of sin coming upon us. These sins, they're already here. Filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate. That's what we had last night. You know what debate is? As you think about debate, it's really not even a scriptural thing. You know, I say I debated somebody. But truly, what, when you talk to somebody, when you contend, when you admonish, what you're trying to do is to change their opinion, right? You're trying to get them to get right. Really, these spectacles, these debates people have in these schools, you know, they set up these debate teams, it's really just more a big show. Who's wise? Who's smart? You know, who can you make like you? It's not necessarily about changing hearts. I don't even think, right here, it's listed among all these sins as people who just argue just for the sake of a show. And that's what you see on social media, isn't it? They don't really want to change anybody for good. I want to tell you my opinion and that'll make you a better Christian. It's really just so, hey, bow down to my wisdom. Think I'm smart. Give me some more likes. Give me some more attention. Yeah, it's, it's the world's. That's the world's version of a Christian's admonishing one another, sharpening iron, trying to... It's the world's. It doesn't do the same thing. Full of envy, murder. There's your abortion. Debate. Deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God. It's a world filled with wickedness. People who hate God. There it is. Sometimes I say that in preaching. I say, people hate God. And even when it comes off my tongue, I was like, you know, is that verifiable? Can I back that up? There it is. People absolutely hate the Lord. Despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. There's a lot of evil in this world. I talk about LGBTQ, which absolutely should include all the pedophilia. It's just as perverted. Our world is perverted. We're there. So perverted, we're looking for new flesh, new ways to um, be perverted. Reminds you exactly of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Sodom and Gomorrah. That story, it's like you scratch your heads. Well, Two angels come into the town, and then the, the men of Sodom and Gomorrah want to know them, which means they want to have relations with them. How could it come to that? Why was that the thing they thought of? Well, because the world is perverted, and they weren't satisfied with the use of women, weren't satisfied with the use of men. Who knows about animals? Heaven forbid children were there. Um, that's the state of a fallen world. And our children have to live in it. The Lord tarries without understanding covenant breakers, 
without natural affection, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Do me a favor, and if you ever hear somebody who doesn't have a clue about homosexuality, they don't ever preach against it, just shut them off and get away from them. You, you've got to stand strong on this issue if you're going to stand strong on anything, you know what I mean? It's a joke that some churches today, let's say some churches in our valley with the biggest congregations, they approach these passages and they just breathe over them, right? That's not my ministry. It's not a part of my ministry. At our church, we're focused on winning souls, right? Not my ministry here. We have multiple churches in this town that do that. They are false prophets. They are seeds of Satan. They are the reason our world is falling apart. False pulpits. They're all over. I think we might be surprised. Ask that. I wish if people ever hear, if people hear the sermon online, go to your church and ask them, why do we never preach against homosexuality? Didn't we, have, we had a visitor a couple of weeks ago who was surprised that I mentioned um, transgenders, you know, or the idea that people are changing genders. Surprised, because they didn't, that hurt in a few years. Shouldn't be that way. Shouldn't stop preaching against sin, especially sins that are abominable to God, that God designates about a whole chapter to, to rebuking. Without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. They are unmerciful, and this wicked world will show no mercy to Christians. That's why we need to be close to the Lord. Close to the Lord. Because we're not going to get mercy. I already mentioned we're not going to get mercy out of that conservative crowd. When the world points the guns at Christians about being too hateful about homosexuality, all of our conservative friends, they're going to meander off with their gun in their hand and their tail between their legs and be like, well, you know what? Love is love. You know, what someone does in their own bedroom, that's their, that's their business. You know, that, that church, they kind of, they bother me too. They preached against my adulterous marriage, so I'm not going to stand with them. That's how it's going to go down. They're not going to stand with us. So surround yourself. I got conservative friends, but they are going to be fair weather friends. They, if, if they can keep their, their gun and their dog and their third wife and their beer, they're going to be okay. But we're going to be in jail. That's why to get too political, we'll turn our past here in a second, I'll tell you just what I mean, but the Bible says, we'll get to the last verse, keep yourselves from idols, and idols can be that. The idol of conservatism, right? Politics, a ticket, a man you vote for, things like that, let's talk about it. Um, let's finish this out, it says, who knowing the judgment of God, this is important verse too. Knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. The world knows these sins are wrong and damning and damaging, yet they have pleasure in watching other people do them. It makes them feel good that someone else is doing a sin just like they're doing. Right? It's called, and it's called a terrible state of the world. You know, in your heart, the worst thing, have you ever had a time in your heart, I think I have in my heart before, where you're not right with God, and so actually it lifts your spirit to see somebody else who's not right with God? Oh well, yeah, that person's not walking very good either. <laughs> good. <laughs> That's good. Sin loves company. That's how our whole world operates, though. We're just, we pat each other on the back. They're, oh, those people are messed up too, and they're, they're worse than I am. boy. Okay, let's go back to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. A wicked world. A world that lieth in wickedness. 5 verse 1. So how should we live? I think this chapter answers it, or it's one of many chapters that helps answer this question. How do we live? 5 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. The key to overcoming this world, as we'll see in verse 4, is get saved. Get saved. Get out of the fray of the wicked, blinded, dark minds that are just going to live in sin and die in sin. People need the Lord. People can still get saved. That's what we're having church. People come this Sunday and get saved. We still believe that, right, folks? All my friends, we still believe that? People can get out of the fray just the same way I and you did. We're nothing special. We're not. We're just dumb enough to believe this old book. Right? Just childlike enough to believe the old book. We need to find some people still dumb enough. 
so childlike enough. Just mainly not full of themselves. It's that pride that's ruined the gospel, that's ruined our world. Professed themselves wise, they became fool. Okay. Two, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. You know I preach this and I try to preach it clearly. The Bible helps us to make love not abstract. So when the world says, well, wait, 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 there's Romans 1, but the Christians are just supposed to love people, right? Well, let's not make it abstract. How do we love people? You love people by keeping God's commandments, right? You live a life that's pure, striving to be holy like Christ is holy, and obeying His commandments also when He calls us to go into the world and preach the gospel and the full counsel of God, all the gospel. That's how we love the world. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. I looked at that a little bit today, as others have commented. We shouldn't view the Christian life as impossible, as obeying the Word is hard. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. We can obey God's Word, even the hard parts. I, on Sunday, I appreciated people being honest and saying, you know, this is a hard rule for me to follow. I appreciated that. That's honest. There are a lot of rules that are hard at face value, but we can overcome every one of them. Right? Right? For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. The just shall live by faith. Yeah, we'll need it. And I think we're going to learn really what faith is all about as we are tempted more and more to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Five, who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. It is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. You know, to overcome in this world, we need to be saved. We need to obey God and God's Word. And then here, 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. I'd simply say as a side note that it helps if you find the right Bible because that verse is, found, is only found in the King James, a verse that's key to the Trinity, key to the deity of Christ, which we just talked about in Romans chapter 1, which the world tries to deny is the deity of Christ. So find a Bible that doesn't take that verse out. And if you do that, then you have to lead to the King James. Only found in the King James. Eight, and there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. It is a marvel, and I do, I do commend my old pastor, my father. A verse like verse seven, you know, they say it's not found in the oldest and best manuscripts, right? Which were trash manuscripts. They found them in obsolete locations because they were thrown away, they were discarded. But my father used to make the argument, he probably still does, that, yeah, the devil really wanted to stick this verse back in, right? <laughs> right? The devil really wanted to strengthen the deity of Christ's doctrine. No, this verse was there. It was in other manuscripts, not the old corrupt manuscripts. We can stand sure on the doctrine of the deity of Christ, also the blood of Christ, which other versions leave out as well. Look at verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that not, excuse me, he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Everything has to do with whether you believe in who Christ was, right? Was Christ just a man who came to earth and died? Or was Christ a man who came to earth who was God, who was deity, who was the Godhead, and the power thereof to save your souls? It's all about Christ. It's all about Christ. If you understand this, and especially this next verse, let's read the next verse, then I'll comment. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. That verse says you can know you have salvation. I love it. I love it. You can take it to the bank that you're saved, that you have eternal life, a home in heaven. That means you can't lose it. That means that Christ did it all, paid for it all. But if you understand that, Christ, our all in all, the Savior, 
God manifests the flesh, the power to save eternally, to seal us into the day of redemption, then you understand why Christians must preach on issues, preach on isms, right? Preach on false doctrines, false churches, because all the churches that I usually name and more, Mormons, Catholics, Jehovah Witnesses, etc., 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 they do not believe in Christ and the Godhead. They don't. They preach a false Christ. They are, false churches are the ones who give the world that they retain God, and they have God, right? But they deny Him. They have God, but they deny Him, their works. Well, it's because they teach this false God, just this Christ. No power to truly save you. You need to do it yourselves. They are the ones that also glorify your works, glorify the creature more than the Creator, God. And this is the confidence that we have in Him. If we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. We know that He wants to save souls. So if you ask God to save you, then He will. And we know there that you can know you have salvation. Know that you have eternal life. Use that when you debate. I, I say that to my relatives. I have relatives who are Catholics. And I ask them, do you know you have eternal life? Mm, the best they can muster is, I hope so. I hope so. Well... Somewhere your faith is falling short. Our faith in Christ is sure. That's how we're going to overcome the world. That's how we know we've got an abiding Holy Spirit that's going to be able to get us through all the world's problems. You think about that. You think you could lose your salvation? You can also lose the Holy Ghost that you need terribly to walk this earth in wisdom? Train your kids right? We should count on the Holy Spirit. In our every action, count on prayer. 16, if any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that you should pray for it. All righteousness is sin and there is a sin not unto death. People ask, what is the sin unto death? What is the sin unto death? I believe it's really clear in scripture, so much so that we don't have time to study the whole thing, but the sin unto death, as I understand scripture, is the sin that you remain in. That's the sin and the death. When you don't give up sin, when it becomes your lifestyle as a Christian and as a non-Christian, sin and the death is the sin you won't give up. I don't think it's any sort of, you know, magical, oh, you did this one sin, there it is, you're done, you lost your salvation or it's the end of the world. Uh, no, it's a sin you choose to define your whole life. And then when you stand before God, that's your number one name. You get a lot of sub names, a liar and a drunk or whatever, but your main name is, there he is, that's the fornicator. There he is, that's the idolater, whatever it may be. Sin unto death. For a Christian, I believe, it's also very relevant. I believe that as Christians do dabble in sin, in a sinful lifestyle, they're not going to lose their salvation. No, no, no. But I believe um, God can view it just the same way. Remaining in sin, not forsaking a sin. As far as judgment coming on your life. That makes sense? Okay, we're almost done. 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Another phrase there, not to belabor the point, because we covered it before, but it says, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Related to what I was saying before, it's talking about a lifestyle sin. That same sin unto death is that lifestyle sin. That sin's talking about the same thing. If you're saved, you won't be named. You won't be known by that one sin. And we know that how? You can look anywhere in the Bible, especially you can look back towards, um, where do we start? Remember it said we have an advocate with the Father. If we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. That was chapter 2 and verse 1. So yes, Christians still sin, but they are not known by that one lifestyle sin. 19, and we know that, the, that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. In this context of what we just said there, some more passages that I'm, I'm sorry I'm skipping through for a second time but we then understand how the whole world lieth in wickedness it's people giving in their lifestyle as the sin it's not just one time things it's not them having this struggle between the Holy Spirit and their sin nature it's not only Christians have that struggle right and Christians should be trying to win that struggle through prayer and fellowship with the saints and faithfulness to God's word and God's house. She's trying to win that battle. But the world has no such battle. They are all darkness. They are all blindness. All sin. And that's why the whole world lies in wickedness. That's why I just wish we had somebody in office that had a little bit of that own struggle in their heart. It would make a world of difference. 
And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding, and that we may know, excuse me, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. This is a, these are some really neat verses. I'm skipping through them. Sorry. Get the Holy Ghost. God. 21. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Why does he end this beautiful book that I'm sorry, my reading skills, my preaching skills, I don't do it justice. It's a beautiful book with so many quotable lines. Why does he end it at the very end? Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Because they can destroy all the beautiful things of this book. When you set something up above God, Set something above God. The world in Romans 1 do it and they never turn back. They, they pursue things that are unseemly. But even Christians here, even little children, it says keep yourselves from idols. Don't put things above God or we'll miss the mark. We'll miss the boat. Um, idols. Sacred cows of our day. Sacred cows, absolutely. I believe Christians could be caught up in the sacred cows of our day. They could be caught up in feminism, right? From non from twenty four seven, you have this argument that um, women's rights are undermined, and they need to, you know, be more and go on and do more and all this. And there's no talk about a holy calling or a spiritual calling. There's no recognition. There's no appreciation for a spiritual calling. Not none at all. But Christians can get caught up in that sacred cow. Christians can get caught up in the sacred cows of judge not lest you be judged of we need to accept people and love on people. That's just a sacred cow, a misapplication of scripture. Sacred cow in, in October of this year and November is the sacred cow of politics, where now you see all these vocal proclaimers, right? And they say all these deep things. And, and I'm like, you don't need just in October to finally start saying, well, one guy's gonna preach, one guy might be for abortion, one guy might not be. I'm glad you're saying it, but all year long we should be preaching against abortion to change people's minds, right? to change people's hearts. We get in October and think if we just elect this one man, then he will make our nation righteous again. It's, it's falling apart of the seams. Our Supreme Court, I don't care, even if we get to be able to put somebody else in there, it's falling apart of the seams. Not going to be sustainable. Sacred cows, social causes, even social causes that we might like, like guns. Social causes, um, that I don't mind, you know, the planet and keeping the air clean. I, I like clean rivers and I like clean air, but it can become a sacred cow, right? An idol in our lives. How about this? And I'll close with this one. It's a stupid one to close on, but idols and worshiping man and the creature more than the creator. How about our stupid celebrities? How about our stupid celebrities? And I mean from every, in every way, shape, or form of the word, every meaning of the word from people in the NBA thinking that because they make a million bucks and can dunk a basketball, that they are you know, someone to be looked to for wisdom. They have no biblical wisdom. It's not NBA, NFL, um, Major League Baseball, and Hollywood. These people are on a pedestal. We've put our nation, our wicked, wicked people, our wicked world, we've put them on pedestals, up like gods. We really have. How does that happen? How does that happen? They've become living, breathing idols. I mean, I like sports. You know I'm a sports guy. But I'm sorry, in a different era, you know what Michael Jordan would be? He would just be a god. A false god. LeBron James, I don't know. Aaron Judge, a baseball player. These guys are just false idols that people, we bow down to everything they ever say. Oh, what did he tweet? What did he say? They're all the world's idols. Isn't it sad what our world has become? We've got meaningless lives on every corner in sin. But we look to these idols instead of looking to God. It's pretty sad. Christians have got to keep preaching. We've got to keep preaching. I, don't, I didn't want tonight to be more of a downer or a depressing thing, but more of a sobering of if the opposition wins, buckle up. Buckle up. But we need to buckle up anyways because in four years, something's going to happen anyways. We should understand that even in conservative leadership, we still, within the last year, have had calls to shut down churches, right? We still, and I don't know what made this was in the previous administration, we still have had people get in trouble for not making cakes for weddings that they didn't agree with, right? Their own private business. They've, I think that must have been the Obama administration. Yeah, it was. But that's already happened, right? One more push 
of liberal f philosophy, and they will come for us in our homes, in our homeschooling, in our Christian schooling, in our churches, in our works. Pray for one another. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we know you're going to guide us. You know you're going to protect us. We know there's no safer place to be than to be a Christian in the year 2020. And Lord, um, there's no more dangerous place to be than to be an unbeliever. Just a breath away, the end of breath away from hellfire. Lord, we believe this truth. We're not ashamed of it. We're not ashamed of it, Lord. And help us be confident that the whole world, when, though they may mock us and put us down and, and deny us and deny our invites to come to church, to hear the gospel, to accept the Savior, we know, Lord, their heart of hearts, they know the truth, that they're a sinner and that they need the Savior, Lord. Help us make a compelling argument through Scripture that they trust Christ before it's eternally too late. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.